Hey guys, welcome back to Why It's Not in the Bible. I'm Taylor. And I'm Kaloran. And today we are reading all about a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, aka the Book of Wisdom. It's a book with many names. And Casey, you actually read it firsthand. Yes. While I was working hard on my undergrad in intercultural studies with Global University, I had to graze past wisdom literature of all sorts, including the Apocrypha. The Wisdom of Solomon is what we'll be talking about today. So all the wisdom literature, so Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Job, um, it kind of plays into a bunch of different themes in all of those books. So if you've read those, Wisdom of Solomon will feel like um, a familiar friend. Yeah, it's got like, and, and kind of similar to Ecclesiastes, it's also one that like a lot of people say Solomon wrote it, and we don't actually know that that's true, right? <laughs> no, not at all. In fact... My textbook actually called it Pseudo-Solomon. So for today's um, uh, purposes, we'll be calling the author of this book Pseudo-Solomon. Can we call um, him Pseudo-Man? Unless we come up with a better nickname, like S-Dog. I think we're going to go with S-Dog. Let's call S-Dog. him S-Dog. So Taylor, what do you know about S-Dog? Well, <laughs> when was S-Dog. it written? Tell us about this. <laughs> Well, S-Dog, uh, I mean, the, the wisdom of S-Dog is uh, it's from mid-first century BCE. So basically like 50 years-ish before Jesus was born. So it's still solidly in the Old Testament time frame, but it's written a lot later than most Old Testament books. But it's written still like at least 100 years before the New Testament books would start being written. It's not old enough for like Jewish scholars to take it seriously and to include it in a lot of the like Old Testament wisdom literature. But it's it's still respected enough by a lot of the like New Testament church fathers and thinkers that it ended up in kind of like a weird place in terms of like whether people thought it was legit or not. Um, so, so I can explain more about that later, but maybe first what, what's in this book case. So basically, as I said, it's kind of, kind of plays into a lot of things. The main, um, desire of S dog was to, um, kind of share a palpable scripture of, um, more about wisdom, obviously Mm -hmm. to the Greek speaking people, probably in Egypt. Um, but also kind of people that even could have been Jewish or, um, that weren't really holding true to their faith. So yeah, it was kind this, of like Hellenistic society. Sort exactly. Of. So it was, um, it involved some Plato, um, themes, um, like mm-hmm. the philosopher of Plato. Right. And, um, not like, not like, not like, uh, Plato, like the, no, no, not this book. Um, <laughs> Missed we that can book. get to that in future apocryphal books, um, but uh, this book is pretty vanilla when it comes to themes that are palpable to us Christians today. Um, not so much like Jesus murdering people as we saw in other books, like the infancy, infancy gospel. There's no dragons book. here. There's not Such none of a that. Great book. It, it, like it genuinely feels like a book that I, I like. I would believe a lot of these chapters could totally be in the normal Bible, and I wouldn't like blink an eye at all. For sure, and like the fact that we know. Um, why kind of it was written or what we believe um, as to why it was written uh, makes me feel better about what's in it because it does kind of feel like it came from a different angle, just like Matthew in the Gospels came from an angle of um, Jewish uh, beliefs and heritage and fulfilled prophecies for Jesus. It kind of came from that direction when talking about the life of Jesus. So in um, the Wisdom of Solomon, it kind of deals with, um, I'll just say three different themes of creation, of death, and what happens um, in the afterlife, and Mm -hmm. Lady Wisdom. So, Lady uh, Wisdom, big theme in this, all about Lady Wisdom here. She is uh, Captain Marvel. I mean, I, I hate to do another Avengers reference, but she does kind of trump all of the wisdom literature. She makes a uh, an appearance in all of them, um, and wisdom. So really, much more the Nick Fury of of, <laughs> of, yeah. of the Bible. True. Um, the, Lady Wisdom comes in at the end, like it's like Solomon. He's by himself in the temple. He just finished making the temple, and like, what's that in the dark corner? It's Lady Wisdom leaned back okay. in a chair, and she's like, "I'd like to talk to you about the Wisdom Literature Initiative," and like, <sighs> cut to black. I really personally, what I really like about um, Wisdom of Solomon mm-hmm. is that uh, 
it is kind of unwrapping in a further, um, just like further delving into, I guess, the themes that we talked about in Proverbs, especially. In mm -hmm. fact, sometimes it, it seems like it quotes Proverbs um, that uh, all of the normal, like, this is how you live a moral life. This is how you live a Christian life. Um, it kind of goes deeper into that and talks about maybe more of the philosophy side of things, which was usually what appealed to the Greek audience. Um, yeah. So go ahead. Well, no, and I, I think that that makes sense, uh, particularly when you think about the audience for the book. It's it's a book that, like, is structured in, like, three parts, although I think that they all, in my experience, they all kind of blended into each other. Like, I knew going into it that it was going to have this structure, and it was still a little hard for me to, like, notice the particular differences and changes in it. But, like, the way that, like, analysts break down the book is there's the beginning part is exhortations. If you've ever read Proverbs, it's basically like that. It's like, be wise, be just. That's how you live a blessed life. And then you get like the middle section, which is a speech by, they all but say Solomon. They're like, uh, it's like the son of David and the man who built the temple. And you're like, okay, so, it, so it's Solomon. <laughs> but but it, we didn't say Solomon. Uh, the copy I said I had was like the book of wisdom, not the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, so they're like really getting cutesy with it. But then he has a speech in the middle that's all about his own pursuit of wisdom. It feels very like shades of Ecclesiastes um, in terms of like, oh, I chased this, but it's way less depressing than Ecclesiastes. It's like, oh, and it all worked out for me. And then the last section is all about Lady Wisdom and how she was guiding the Israelites through every step of their journey through the entire Torah section of the Bible. Uh, and how, oh, she was there for Abraham, she was there for Joseph, she was there for Moses and the children of, of Israel and Egypt. Like, uh, and and it, like, I don't know about you, but, but uh, Kalorn, did, did you notice in this book that, like, boy, it feels like Lady Wisdom has gone beyond being just, like, an idea and is like, oh, Lady Wisdom equals God. Like For sure. And I think um, that leads perfectly into one of the observations um, about uh, Wisdom of Solomon or the Book of Wisdom is that um, Lady Wisdom kind of turns into God personified. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels maybe uncomfortable um, to conventional Christians that have said father and um, very male terms for God, but um, yeah. I'm not being like, uh, what is it, Ari Ariana Grande, like God is a woman, but <laughs> is that, is it God is a woman? Anyway. Yeah, that's um, the song. It's also not really about God. It's, it's Don't about... look up that song. Um, we're not, we're not. Definitely anyway, apocryphal. I Definitely apocryphal. I literally just know the name of the song. Um, the but we're not saying like, God is uh, one gender or another. Um, if we are made in God's image and we truly believe that, then probably God possesses a lot of traits. So Lady Wisdom kind of, to me, makes me feel a little bit better. Like, ah, we're talking about she. We're using she pronouns. And she guided uh, the Israelites through their whole history and kind of seems like Lady Wisdom and the Spirit of God and those types of terms mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Old Testament or um, in the Book of Wisdom um, are pretty, uh, we can pretty much say that was God personified in the Old Testament, but just not in words that they um, probably could pinpoint at that time. Um, so yeah. God is our father and God as um, this lady wisdom character is kind of what I'm getting from this book. Yeah. And, and when I was sort of like researching this, because I wanted to know more before we got into the video, there's like a whole also messianic level to this book, which was super fascinating for me because like what I'd always heard about the Apocrypha, because this is a book that is considered canonical within like the Catholic and Orthodox Church, but not within Protestant denominations and not by the Jewish people. And Base, and, and, like, I'd always heard that, like, oh, the reason the Apocrypha books are the Apocrypha is that God's presence isn't really made known in them. That, like, the idea is, like, oh, they're good history, they're good to be there, but, like, but the Bible is supposed to have, in one way or another, God's presence felt on every page. And his presence isn't really in the Apocrypha right. books. And this book completely dispatches with that idea. Like, that, I, I can't cling to that as my reasoning for why the Apocrypha is what it is, which is already 
interesting because we're like three videos deep now. But um, because it like it gets messianic in ways that feels very like Isaiah or or parts of that yeah. um, point where like the book of Hebrews I found out thanks to um, I was looking at New World Encyclopedia uh, that gave me some of this cool. information and they were like yeah the book of Hebrews basically directly doesn't quite quote, but like quotes in that way that like Paul quotes a lot of the Old Testament, which is basically like, yeah, it's more or less a quote from it. He just didn't like use the the quotation marks around it because there wasn't punctuation. Um, but like Wisdom 726 says, she is a reflection of light, a spotless mirror of the eternal, uh, of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Um, compare that then to Hebrews 1.3, which says, he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. Where it's like, it seems like the author is trying to be like, see, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Lady Wisdom prophecy. Right. At, at other points, they'll be like, oh, who is Lady Wisdom? Well, wisdom is the pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. It is the fashioner of all things. It is an associate in his works, his referring to the Father. And it's like, that feels very language that we would use for, like, Jesus or the Holy Spirit uh, sure. throughout the New Testament. Did, did yeah. you get that same vibe? Yeah, exactly. And it kind of reminded me, too, of, um, Taylor, if you remember um, when Stephen, the martyr, was yeah. being stoned, and he's like, but wait, I want to remind you guys of the entire history of the Hebrew nation. Like, okay. It's like the last Timing, five chapters. Timing, Stephen. When you're getting stoned for your beliefs, like, Well, whoa. he shared that before he got stoned. He, sh he was in front of, like, the Sanhedrin or whatever, and then he told a story, and then they so did not like his story that then they stoned him. Exactly. So if you're being, like, in this position of being this spectacle and not shying away from your faith and saying Jesus is Christ and all this stuff that... Honestly, in today's day and age, we would be pretty quick to shy away from if put under pressure and mm -hmm. persecution. And he's like, let me share with you everything that's ever happened to the Israelites and how God was faithful. So this reminds me a lot. Lady Wisdom reminds me so much. And what um, uh, S-Dog is talking about in his book, his or her book, probably a his um that uh, God has always come through for his people, mm -hmm. especially the Hebrews, but he's always come through for us. And I think if any lesson we're going to learn, which we really should try to learn from even these apocryphal books. Um, okay, you say that, but we're also doing the Book of Enoch next week. So maybe let's not learn too much from that. So maybe the, the lesson from some of these books is that we should really stay away from all of the themes of these books. But in this book, if we're going to try to yeah. extract some lick of knowledge from it, it would be that God has always come through for us. And mm -hmm. we may not know um, we were not present at creation and we may not know um, all the details of end times. But we do know what's now and in the present. And that is that God is loving and a father, uh, mother <laughs> to us. And he is um, always coming through for us, even when we don't know um, and wisdom is that thing that is, uh, Taylor and I were raised this way, and I'd like to share this, um, that peace is that thing that um, is what guides us. And so when mm -hmm. we usually don't feel peace, um, we recognize that as the Holy Spirit kind of saying uh, possibly a yellow or a red light on yeah. whatever topic. So uh, when we're going to make decisions or anything, it's that peace that guides us. And I can't help but think in these wisdom books, um, especially um, the ones that are in the Bible, but even Wisdom of Solomon or the Book of Wisdom, that Lady Wisdom is kind of that Holy Spirit force, but also the peace um, that mm. comes through for God's people and leads them and guides them and kind of shows them where to go when there wasn't an audible voice guiding them. So do you want to know uh, what the early church thought of this book? Of course I want to know, Taylor. Tell me. Okay. All right. Hold well... on. Since you since you begged, uh, so the early church generally really liked this book. Uh, they felt pretty similar to you in that regard. So uh, one of the things that so like the people who said yes 
to this book. Like, yes, this is canon. This belongs in the Bible. Uh, Augustine. Love Augustine. Yeah, uh, usually agree one, with him. Just Pope kidding. Innocent I, one of the early popes, one of the good ones by all accounts. One of the good ones. I mean, he's innocent. And he's the first innocent. <laughs> um, uh, and also, a. now that I think about it, Pope Innocent is maybe the most guilty name that you can give Pope Innocent? <laughs> Feels like you're protesting a bit too much. <laughs> Anyways, there were also a bunch of like councils of like, oh, we summoned the council of all the elders together and we all agreed, yes, this book is canon. And there's like, there's too many for me to name, but there's like five or seven or something like that, like different councils that are all like, yep, this book's legit. Um, really, the people who said no on it were Jewish scholars who really did not include that in most of their wisdom literature when they were bundling it all together. Um, and also a guy named Epiphanius who just was like, ah, I'm not convinced. And then there was uh, Athanasius, who I think we talked about a couple episodes ago when we talked about the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, and his take was interesting. His take was, I don't think it's canonical, but I do still think people should read it, which is uh, an interesting stance to take. That feels, exactly. feels a little fancy Fencerton on my... <laughs> You know, it's it's probably not, but you should just read it anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> like when you recommend a show to a friend, it's like it's not that good, but like you should you should watch it. You oh should, my gosh, should. it truly really convinces people to watch it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's pretty much the rundown on uh, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of S Dog. So hope you guys enjoyed this installment. Yes. Of why it's not in the Bible. Like I, this I saw- video, share it. Um. Our hope in these videos is that uh, people can really just learn about um. Mm-hmm things that are kind of a part of our Christian heritage and history, but that aren't in the Bible so that we can learn from it, um, maybe learn from the negative parts of it, but also learn from the positive parts of it, um, that maybe it's not in the Bible, but why is it not? Or um, why could it have made the cut? Um, We really appreciate your views, and we will be back next time with some spicy material about Enoch. I may, have gotten, I may have gotten a little bit bored reading uh, uh, Wisdom, and I was Just like, kinda... what's the wildest thing I could find? And Just... then I found Enoch, and I was like, ah, this is not just one video. This is five videos. Yeah, so get ready. <laughs>